Hey there, I have a carbon fiber quickie project to share with you today. Uh, I'm about to make a composite, let's say carbon fiber um, engine oil sump for my neutral engine. And um, I shall go uh, through the process with you. So the mold has already been prepped, it's already been, already been done. Uh, it's a male mold, so we'll get to um, the specifics later of what is involved in doing that kind of mold. Um, now we're going to focus on the layup day. So this is going to be an infusion, meaning uh, I will lay up dry fiber and then we will pretty much suck resin through the stack. Let me give you a short insight of uh, what kind of carbon fiber you can use in your projects. Uh, you probably have heard already of uh, fabrics like this plain weave. Uh, this is typically what you get from carbon fiber shops. Um, there you can see all the layers that have been intertwined, um, one toe um, going over and under the, the, the following. And uh, so this is what gives you this uh, fabric texture. So typically uh, you will have only two directions. This is a bidirectional fabric, right? Um, so you have uh, the warp, which is in the zero degree direction and the weft, which is in the 90 degree direction. So this means it's an orthotropic material. You have um, properties aligned in the zero and 90. Now, while this is interesting, there's not all there is to composites. Now, this fabric is really different and it's, uh, it's a very different kind of animal. You, you don't find that um, in many places. This is a triaxial fabric. It's made by AMP. It's only slightly different um, based on the manufacturing process um, from the plain fabric I just uh, showed you because uh, this has not been woven, it has been braided. So the machinery is a little bit different, but still the physical uh, re realization is pretty much the same. Although um, you should see that this has a triangular pattern, meaning there are three different fiber directions. Uh, there is a zero, a plus 60 and minus 60. And what that means is uh, within a single layer, this fabric is actually pretty much isotropic, uh, meaning it has more or less the same properties in any given direction in the plane. And why is that? Because uh, the fibers are pretty much equal uh, an equilateral triangle um, with each angle uh, between uh, each leg be, uh, being uh, 60 degrees. So that gives you uh, a balance. And uh, if, you, if you look at uh, strength and modulus, um, in any given direction, it fluctuates, but it stays pretty much constant. So this is very interesting. Although it is pricey, um, that is about uh, $40 um, per square meter. And this one is uh, really heavyweight. It's about uh, 570, if I remember, um, 570 uh, grams per square meter. So it's rather thick, but you can find, um, you can find actually thinner grades for that. Now, this is even different. Uh, you um, really see that um, not so often in DIY project, and I think that deserves a mention. This is um, a multi-axial fabric. It's also sometimes referred to as non-woven or non-cream fabric. And uh, difference comes from here, the manufacturing process. So this is pretty much uh, four layers in one single fabric. Uh, you will see the surface layer here has a zero degree. If you turn to the back side, it is now 45. And in between, you also have minus 45 and 90 degrees. Uh, how does that come? You can see that this is pretty much unidirectional fiber, um, which any fabric is uh, based on, but this is different because the layers are now just stacked and they are stitched together or quilted. Uh, and you can see here the thread that holds uh, the toes together. And this is uh, th this process gives it unique properties. It doesn't have any crimps, so it's supposedly a little bit stiffer uh, than fabric because fabric has crimped has crimp um, because of the toes going over and under uh, over and over again. Um, and you can find that in many many flavors because the weaving process um really um requires having only two orientations to happen a little bit different with the braiding but still 
here you can actually have this is a quadriaxial because you have four uh, layers in one but you could have um, b axials with uh, 0 090 or plus minus 45 or you could as well have three axials or even higher uh, even higher counts uh, but the point is um, this process uses much less expensive uh, carbon fiber toes now what is a toe this is a toe or a bundle. Um, you can see it's very, very difficult to figure out uh, the thickness of one fiber within the toe. It's, it's uh, much, much thinner than a human hair. Now, this toe, for instance, is a bundle of many, many individual fibers. And it's called 12K toe because it has 12,000 fibers in it. Typical toes, uh, typical toes used for uh, fabric manufacture are 3K, so which means you now only have uh, 3,000 of them. This triaxial fabric has 12K though, and this multiaxial here, uh, non-woven, has 50K toes. Um, what's the point? Well, actually, um, the bigger the fiber count in the toe, the less expensive is the toe. So this kind of multiaxial is very inexpensive because of the fiber it is based on. Um, you can see that kind of fabric uh, being retailed for about 30, 35 uh, dollars per square meter. This starts at 23 and can go as low as 16 depending on the quantity you're purchasing. So it is very inexpensive. Besides, it is also quasi isotropic, so you don't have uh, to mind the orientation which you use during layup, which is very interesting. And the stitching uh, between the different layers actually helps with infusion. And it does not handle all that bad. Um, actually, I was expecting it to be much harder to drape and, and conform around the mold, but it's actually very similar to a fabric. And I, 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 I will say I will find um, a pro for this which is it doesn't unravel as easily as fabric now let's have a look at this one for instance you can see all the fibers here uh just where i cut it uh unraveling from the from the from the edge and losing now this one is a great fabric but it's even worse now you can see how easily it will distort and it's not easy with dry fabric it's actually even worse uh once it's separated with resin when you do wet layer so on the other hand, uh, this one relies on the stitching rather uh, than the, the weaving uh, to hold the pattern. So this holds up really, really well um, to draping, which, which is very good actually. Okay, now let me walk you through the draping process, vacuum bagging process and infusion process. So as mentioned, I'm going to lay up uh, six layers of 300 GSM quadrioxal fabric. You don't have much choice but to cut all in all the corners because otherwise the fabric would be very hard to drape around. Now the key to a good composite layup uh, for a box like this is alternating the pattern. You will see me changing the position of the cuts from one layer to another because this uh, avoids the presence of uh, weak links in the layer. Typically you want an overlap that's between 10 to 20 millimeters. The aerospace standard that I know of is between 12 and 25 millimeters. But this makes a little difference here because we're not looking for strength, we're actually more looking at stiffness. I'm using an Infutac uh, tax spray, which is absolutely necessary here because we have a complex shape. And unlike Prepreg, which has a lot of tag, depending on the product, obviously, but the dry fabric has absolutely no tag, so you have to use something to hold it in place. You don't really have to debug a dry fabric layer for infusion like this one, although it can be helpful sometimes when you want to avoid uh, such things as uh, wrinkling or bridging. Now those are the two most common composite defects that you will find. Bridging is when you lay fabric in a female corner, when you add layers and layers, you will see that um, the more layers you add, the harder it is for the fabric to reach the bottom of the corner. Conversely, wrinkling is when you lay on the male corner 
and you will see that it adds too much material and in the end you will end up with a wrinkle at the top of the corner. So bridging typically means you will get a resin rich area which will be much thicker but could also have porosity or even delamination. Wrinkling might actually be worse because it means you have a kink in the fibers so you lose strength and you lose stiffness. So you definitely want to avoid that. Although on such a box shape with dry fabric it is very very hard to avoid wrinkling. And for us, this is uh, actually where Pruprec shines. Now, Infusion is very, very good for uh, large surface, flat shapes, or might be curved panels, but it's very complicated because of the dry fabric on very sharp corners like those. On the other hand, Pruprec, which has very little bulk, it's very easy for that kind of shape because it tacks and, and, and you know, the thickness is not in excess when you lay up as compared to when you cure. And this is really where uh, bridging and wrinkling come from. See, when you lay up dry fabric, you have a lot of thickness because the fabric contains a lot of air. When you compress in a vacuum, it is going to thin out. And this is where the problem comes, typically in a male corner. This means you will have too much length of material when it compresses around the corner. And that's why you cannot very hardly avoid wrinkling. Now this is why you perform debulk, and this is why Prupreg is better for complex shapes because it has pretty much the same thickness uncured as cured. When I'm done with the actual carbon fiber layup, I will add the peel ply and then the infusion mesh. Now, this is where the problem is here. Um, I didn't have available to me um, a proper infusion mesh, so I used a mesh uh, made to repel birds. Now, it does look very similar, but it's not quite the same. It's not really as thick, but mostly you can expand it very easily, so it's not uh, it doesn't have the same density uh, throughout the part if you're not taking care and this time I did not take enough care uh, mostly on the bottom of the box you can see uh, there's a lot of space in, in between uh, the meshes and I, should, I could have actually have prevented the issue by adding uh, more layers or just uh, uh, trying to expand them less when placing them I also should have um, placed some kind of a resin track to spread the resin evenly over the top, which would have um, speeded up the infusion by a lot. But the real problem is this resin is really, really thick for infusion. It's pretty much like honey, so it's good for wet layer, but it's really hard to suck through the stack because, uh, well, because it's thick. You should typically get uh, an infusion window of two hours and thirty minutes with this resin. Now it went quite a bit longer um, because, well, the temperature was lower, and this this typical window is given for uh, for 70 grams of resin. Within the vacuum bag, you have much less thickness of resin, which has less potential for exotherm. This is an important point. What is exotherm? A chemical reaction such as curing, scientifically called polymerization, releases heat. But heat is also an accelerator for, um, for the chemical reaction. In other words, when your resin pot is starting to heat up, shit in the fan. Because while it builds up heat, heat is going to accelerate even more, which is going to release even more heat. So this resin is very, is very, very exothermic. So when, it, so when the heat kicks in, it can gel within a couple of minutes so this is how I could lengthen the injection window because as soon as I saw that the resin pot was hitting up I replaced it by a fresh resin 
resin mix well the resin within the vacuum bag was not he heating up because there is much less resin at once but eventually I felt this infusion I could not reach the, the trim line of the part within the infusion window the resin gelled about 4 hours into the infusion so I had to proceed with a new infusion next day which is not the base case still it works so I removed the vacuum bag on the sides added some more mesh and proceeded to a new infusion and this time paying attention to the placement of the mesh Well, the molding did not quite go as easily as I would have expected. That can be the problem when laying up on foam. This is where I sell uh, these all leftovers. Even though it is very, very stiff as a foam, when you compress it with vacuum, it will very slightly shrink and then expand back when you release the vacuum, which can explain why it's hard to release. Moreover, I did this small by hand finishing and while well, the Teflon is very good at anti-sticking and there is a 3 degree draft angle on the side of the mold, well you can have irregularities that make the part harder to release on the shape of the, of the walls. By the way, when using that kind of resin which has a high uh, TG and low uh, initial temperature here, well ambient temperature by the way, you want to be very careful when demolding because the resin after 24 hours at ambient temperature really only has a green strength meaning you have to be very careful when manipulating because it is very very brittle and you can see by the way when you remove the vacuum bag that all the resin that's contained within the bag and within the ancillary materials will crack very easily and spread all around the room so that tells you the resin is still very brittle before demolding, I like to leave it for an afternoon under the sun which will hit the resin and, and keep curing the part even more so that it's less brittle to demold. And there you go, it, things did not quite go as planned but in the end I'm still happy with the result. I'm going to coat this on either side anyway, uh, and the inner side, probably with varnish because it's going to be in contact with all so I don't want um, any dry fiber in contact with the oil and the, on the other side I'm, I'm probably going to smooth out the shape um, slightly send the wrinkles because then I will be bonding inserts to pass through fittings and also layer a vacuum bag uh, just one or maybe two layers of twill weave uh, just for aesthetics Well, I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. If you did, please let me know, leave a comment, share it to your friends, and if you want to get the freshest updates, subscribe. I tried to put in fuzzy some comments rather than music this time, so do let me know how you like the content and editing. And we'll be seeing each other on part 2 when I will be trimming, bonding uh, fittings, and laying up an aesthetic skin to make it nicer to look at. Until then, stay safe!